I want to take a couple quick minutes here to talk about uh, cooling, especially with classic American muscle cars because there's a lot of people that are trying to drive them and enjoy them nowadays. And it seems like the biggest thing I hear people complain about is overheating. So let's address what the biggest causes of that are and how you can fix them. For starters, the first thing that seems like everybody does is they complain that their radiator's crap or there's something wrong with their water pump. And while that might be the case in a few of them, I'd say most of the time you're looking in the wrong place. Where you need to be looking is at your distributor and your carburetor. The reason for which is that your tune is off. Typically, what that'll do is either whether it's rich or it's lean, it's going to cause the engine to run hot. Now, these cars are old, they all develop problems over time, especially if they sat for a long time. Biggest thing is with your distributor is you can have weights get stuck or a vacuum advance that's malfunctioning. Both of which will end up with, it might be fine after it sits and they can release and start up, but if you're having problems with hard starting or it just running really hot really quickly, typically timing's the first place to look. Um, the big reason is like if you have a vacuum advance mechanism that's malfunctioning, it could be adding up to 20 degrees of timing at idle. Or while you're cruising, because if the thing is stuck, it's just adding that much of wherever it's stuck at everywhere. Same thing with mechanical advance. I've had where uh, parts got sticky and when you cold start it, it'd be just fine. And then after you run it, it'd come up, it didn't get stuck at full advanced timing. So even when you came back down to idle, it was still at 100% of the timing it was able to have. And it would cause the engine to run hot. So you need to take apart your distributor, and check those things and make sure they're functioning properly. It's a great place to start and it's a cheap, easy thing to do that's a lot less work than starting to try to change radiators and water pumps only to find out that that's not the problem anyway. Next would be the carburetor. For the same reasons, you know, you can have jets get clogged up or metering circuits that get plugged and if the carburetor's not giving the engine the proper amount of fuel, it will be running rich or lean. If it runs lean, it will cause an overheating problem where it's just building more heat in the cylinder than it really should be. And if it's running on the rich side, it'll be burning that fuel like in the exhaust. Uh, that's where you, if it's bad enough, you have exhaust manifolds that are glowing, but it's really just, it's not burning the fuel properly the way it should and it's going to cause additional heat. It's also going to be the cause of a ton of drivability problems. And even if it's not that far off, but it's still off a little bit, it could be the cause of things getting out of whack as far as your cooling system. And that would be because your cooling system is unable to keep up with those things that are tuned wrong as far as how the engine is running. You have to realize these cars left the factory and ran completely fine when they were new. So something has changed. It's not like now that 40 or 50 years later, your car magically needs a bigger radiator or a bigger water pump. That's not how it works. So you need to look at the tune and how it's running. And if you don't have the ability to do that stuff, there's plenty of shops out there that can check that stuff for you. Hell, they'll, you know, you take it to a dyno shop, they'll stick a O2 sensor in the tailpipe and you'll know what it's running at for air-fuel ratio. The carburetor can be tuned properly then. And, you know, if there's something wrong with the ignition system, you can figure that out. But a lot of this stuff is pretty simple and you can do it hands-on in your garage. Now, if, like my Cutlass here, you have something that's heavily modified and, you know, I race with this thing, so I do need more cooling system capacity. And while the old cars shouldn't have needed that stock, a lot of people have upgraded engines and stuff, and yes, having additional cooling capacity is a good thing to have, but if you're trying to band-aid a tuning problem with more cooling capacity, you're not fixing the actual problem, you're just covering it up. Now because I'm racing this car, I have done all of the cooling things. I do have a 
slightly bigger, well actually maybe a slightly smaller radiator, but it's aluminum instead of the copper so it cools better. I have a high volume water pump that I actually, you know, you look and find one that has a good impeller on it. I wouldn't just go off of what claims to be a high volume pump because they're, the difference in impeller designs can make a huge difference. Uh, but the key one that really has solved like all of my issues and disappointingly for me, it was a hard way to learning, this was the last mod I did. And that was adding an expansion tank to the system. These older cars didn't come with that. I mean, when the radiator got full and it got hot, it just pissed the extra coolant out on the ground. And you know, if you pull a radiator cap off when it's cold, it's usually a good two, three inches down from the top of the radiator. So I did this expansion tank because of the demands of racing. And what this also did is I created a proper high point in the system. Because from the factory, it's kind of really a toss up about whether your radiator or possibly depending on where the heater core is mounted, a bunch of cars vary, what's the high point in the system or even you know one of the hoses coming off of the intake manifold could be the high point in the system. And you're gonna end up with air pockets that way. I mean, right now this radiator hose is a high point in the system, which when I'm filling it there, I'll push it down to kind of eliminate that little bit of air. But I'm also able to run it and cycle it, and I have it plumbed in a way that all the air bleeds back up into my overflow tank, or recirculation tank. And now this is plumbed as I'm pulling off of the radiator into here, and it's also pulling from my heater core back to here which both drain out of the bottom and then goes into the recirculation for the water pump. So I'm constantly pulling fluid from here and any air that makes it down to the lower radiator will get popped up and anything that goes into the heater core. Most likely it's going to go to the heater core because that'll be the high point exiting the engine itself. To really complete this system I should have a high point on the radiator plumbed into here also. But I didn't want to do that for, in my case, because I want to make sure that all of the coolant is being pushed through the radiator itself and I'm not uh, bleeding any short distance coolant wise uh, back. I mean, using a much, much smaller line would be the way to go. A lot of newer cars like that, they have a very tiny, like uh, quarter inch line that goes from the top of the radiator into the recirc tank. I'm sure you've noticed by now that my radiator is tipped forward and is standing up in the stock position. That's because I eliminated my factory core support in the name of saving weight on this car. But the reason for tipping it forward is simplification of sealing off the area in front of the radiator. Uh, this is something that older cars are really terrible with. There's so many openings and holes and all kinds of things. Like when I was trying to make the factory uh, core support work, I had five or six sheet panels made and I was taping up holes and I even stuck, you know, there was a gap underneath the radiator that was probably an inch and a half down to the bottom of the top of the core support where air was just bleeding through. I ended up like stuffing a towel in that at one point in time just trying to do everything I could to make sure that the car could cool. And it just still wasn't quite enough uh, for racing this thing out in Colorado at uh, 6,000 and some feet. So I did this for simplification and I'll show you what I got on my front end now. So this is my ducting. I'm able to pull air from the two grills and the bumper slot openings and it all gets forced through the radiator, except for uh, two hoses I got here that are for cooling my brakes as well. If this was a factory setup still, there's a huge air gap on both sides. There's a gap under the radiator, there's gaps above the radiator, and it's just completely open on the bottom. So when the high speed air hits the front of the car, it gets through the grills, but then it'll hit that radiator and it's harder to pass through the radiator than it is to any of those wide open spaces. And when that happens, you have air 
building up in front of uh, the radiator, creating a high pressure zone. So it just flows around the radiator, wherever's interest, and there's not a lot of air getting through the radiator. Now, when these cars were new, that wasn't an issue because they had mechanical fans. And the biggest mistake you can make for trying to keep your classic car cool is putting electric fans on it. Because a mechanical fan, especially with its proper shroud, you should have your shroud on there, pulls an insane amount of air compared to electric fans. Like it's just, it's ridiculous. There's not even a comparison, but that's the reason why electric fans are so popular is because of the horsepower drag of that mechanical fan is big. It's a lot of horsepower it takes because it's moving so much air. Well, now that you've cut the air supply through the radiator by going to an electric fan, you need to make sure you're forcing more air through there. Not all cars had it, but these G bodies did that off of the factory core support, they had a plastic little uh, air dam that stuck down. And what that was to do is that was to catch air coming from under the car and push it up into the radiator. It wasn't perfect because like I said, there was still an inch and a half gap between the radiator and the core support itself on the bottom. But that actually makes a huge difference. And just about any vehicle you go look at nowadays is going to have one of those underneath it unless it's a very modern car, in which case it'll probably be smoothed out for aerodynamics and fuel efficiency, but that's also sealing it from the top side so that the air that is going to the radiator isn't spilling out underneath the car. So building yourself one of those little air dams, it's super easy. I mean, most old cars there, it's a piece of angle iron and some like race car body plastic or plastic of any sort, something that just has some flexibility to it so that if you curve it out, it's not gonna break. But you need it to be rigid enough that's actually going to be catching some air. Um, that can make a huge difference. In fact, on a lot of cars, that can be the difference between overheating while cruising down the road and not because it's just forcing that extra air up onto the radiator. But I've worked on other cars, like uh, one that pops into mind right away is a, a 62 Belair. I mean, those cars had nothing. There was no air dam underneath. The sides were wide open. It was wide open over the top. Like that car needs quite a bit of work if it has an overheating problem because you have to try to like seal all those edges off and try to be able to force more air into the radiator. That being said, that car that I worked on had electric fans. It also had a 555 cubic inch big block Chevy in it that had aluminum heads and a good water pump. And strangely enough, it didn't have overheating problems because it was tuned properly. So there's, there's kind of this balance, but if you're worried about it and you want to build that air dam and maybe make some block off plates, I mean, you can paint them all black, you can hide them behind the grill, I mean, unless somebody like decides they're going to stare through the grill to even notice them in the first place, it's going to be something that people don't notice and it gives you a lot more um, headroom on your cooling system where if all of a sudden your engine goes a little out of tune because something went bad on your carb or your distributor or just, you know, whatever, a spark plug fouled out and all of a sudden now you got a cylinder running bad and it's screwing up the rest of it. You have that headroom because now if you're sitting in traffic or cruising and all of a sudden it's a hundred degree day, you're going to need that headroom because if you're right at the maximum capacity to manage your car on a 75 degree day, well, all of a sudden when it's hotter, you're getting less temperature drop because of the air passing through the radiator is hotter, you'll be just a whole lot safer having that extra headroom. So get out there and have fun. Cars are meant to be driven, not to be show queen coffee tables.